Proverbs chapter 18, and we will conclude the 18th chapter and go into 19 this morning. I'm going to ask you to uh, set a tab at a passage we want to look at in some detail. That's 2 Samuel 23. So, we begin here with 18... 24, a person who has unreliable companions is about to be broken, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now 19.1, better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than the one who twists his lips for he is a fool. Two, if even desire without knowledge is not good, how much more will the one who hastens with his feet miss the way? And 19.3, our final proverb this morning, the folly of a human being overturns his way, but his heart rages against the Lord. And here's the way I'm going to teach these. 24, God only brings the friend. God only brings the friend. 19.1, the blameless life endures. The fool's activity is only for the moment. The blameless life endures. The fool's activity is only for the moment. 19.2, the skill for living is to be patient and wait. The skill for living is to be patient and to wait. 19.3 The heart that rages will ultimately be confined. The heart that rages will ultimately be confined. I normally don't do introductions to the book of Proverbs. These, these lessons uh, are so uh, chocked full of information. I try to get in as many Proverbs as I possibly can, and therefore I don't do introductions. Today, I'm going to do an introduction. Because it involves this class, what happened to me. Uh, when we left the chapel the last time we were together, two weeks ago, we walked outside and there was snow the size of your fist. And it set my schedule back. I ended up getting home rather late, driving in the dark, which I normally don't do. And Therefore, it set my whole schedule off. Uh, my wife actually awakened me uh, Monday morning with a text. And uh, I heard the ding on the phone and I looked and there was a man who I had known for close to uh, 50 years. A companion, an acquaintance uh, who was dead and his obituary. Uh, his service was at 11 o'clock that particular morning. And uh, my wife texted out to me, I thought you would want to know. Uh, it, the service was for family only, but that didn't stop me. I went and I sat in the back corner it was all high church. 
you know, the, the type of service that it's all prefab, generic. Uh, they do all the talking and there's just a little blank space for your name to fit in. And uh, I listened. It was what I expected. It was a stand up, sit down, stand up for the Lord's Prayer, sit down, stand up for the Apostles' Creed, sit down, and we'll do the talking. And it was all the typical verses that I would expect, John 14, the Traveler's Psalm 121. Uh, it was kind of out of place and out of context as far as I was concerned. There was nothing really about the service at all that really related to my friend. He was an unbeliever. I remember reflecting back upon it, our days at college. I used to enjoy in the spring going to his room, and he was the life of the party, drinking his scotch, smoking cigarettes, always had some new music to introduce everybody to. And everybody crowded in. It was party time. And then I got saved, and our relationship got rather formal. Uh, he took a banking job in Dallas. He reached out to me. I was a seminary student at the time, and I went with him, and he picked up a couple of suits, and I directed him to places to go for his new vocation. Then we got reacquainted when I moved to Oklahoma City in 1982 uh, because he was, uh, had working interest in some wells that I was familiar with. So we got back and reacquainted. He was married at the time, and then he divorced. And, uh, but our relationship was never really warm like it used to be very formal. I could tell he was very cautious around me. And, uh, and now he's dead. And uh, I sit there at the back of that uh, auditorium, the only person there. Of course, they went through the ceremony, and now we commend our brother Tom and at that time, I had had about enough. I wanted to stand up and say, commend him on what basis? On what basis do you commend him? I know this man. He had great debt. He had a great debt, a need of righteousness. On what basis do you commend him? All men have great debts. But I didn't. I just sat there... Family filed out. I, I truly believe the book of Ecclesiastes, that it's better to go to a house of mourning than a house of feasting. So I sat in the corner at the back and I just tried to absorb it. Take it all in. There we were in the sterile confines of that place. And I thought to myself, if I could just have taken my friend and put him right there next to me and said to him, this is how it's going to end for you. This is it. The last words pronounced over you. We're in the NFL playoffs. I'm sure you know that. Most of the men know that. You know, and what you have with those playoffs is you have commentary all week long. Everybody's speculating on what is going to happen, who is better at this and that, scrutinizing everything. But when the game starts, that's when the lights come on, that's when the band plays. 
And there's no time for that. It's the game. Every play counts. Every snap of the ball. Total concentration. Well, this is the game for you and me. This is it. It's on. Night comes when no man will work again. But today, today is the game. And so Moses instructing us says, teach us to number our days that we may have a heart of wisdom applying our minds to the skill for living. That's what we're doing here. The game is on. Every day counts. What you do for Christ lasts for eternity. Now that's the introduction. And here's our first proverb. 24, 18, a person who has unreliable companions. A proverb regarding friends and relationships. The proverb draws a line between companions, that word means associations, loose relationships that move in and out of your life, versus the true friend. The first thing I want you to notice is the structure here. It really falls out beautifully. If you have a New American Standard, a King James, or an NIV, just put a comma behind the word friends or friend. That helps you to see the predicates that fall out beautifully. If you have an English Standard Version, put your comma behind companions and line two, friend. It's the companion who is about to be shattered. It's the friend who sticks closer than a brother. The friend versus the companion. The top line, the person of unreliable companions. It's literally a person of neighbors. Now, that's clear. We know all about neighbors from the book of Proverbs. Random third party. The neighbor is the man on the street. Proverbs 3, 27 and 28. Do not withhold good from those with whom it is due when it is your power to act. Specifically, do not say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow. I'll give it to you when you clearly have it with you already. See, it's the relationship that you take advantage of. Putting someone off. Payment. Not someone that you're cultivating for a close association. Neighbor. That's the word. But the friend here in the proverb is the contrast qualified in the book of Proverbs as a lover. That would be Proverbs 17.17. 17, a friend who loves at all times. Proverbs 22.11. One who loves a pure heart and who speaks with grace will have the king for a friend. The proverb says by nature... The companion is unreliable. They wilt in times of adversity for you. The so-called friends of Job would be the perfect example. In Proverbs 19.4, riches attract them, and as long as you have money or you have power, they will rally to you. But it's not you. They're companions. It's your money. It's your gravitas in the community. That's what attracts them. That's why the proverb anticipates 
Look at this, about to be broken. Your translation probably has the word ruin. Here's the word. It's Jeremiah 15, 12. Can iron break iron? Break, that's the word. Same word in Psalm 2, verse 3. The counsel of the Lord breaking the nations. Same word. Upon His return, the establishment of His authority over the empires of the world. The force of the grammar here, look at this, comes to. It's about to be, literally. It's a declaration that it's just around the corner. Now, our contrast here is line two. It's the friend that sticks. We're familiar with that word, sticks. It's the word clinging. It's the word cleave. Genesis 2.24 Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave. There it is. Sticking to his wife. Ruth 1.24 Ruth clung, same word, to Naomi. Loyalty that only God gives. Now, the reason I wanted you to uh, set a tab at 2 Samuel 23 is for the illustration here of this word. What you have uh, in 2 Samuel 23 are the names of David's mighty men. These were the NFL gold coats the Hall of Fame of his fighting people, fighting men. 2 Samuel 23, there beginning in verse 13, there's a story of three of these champions who fought their way into Bethlehem when it was under the control of the Philistines. They bagged up water from the well there and they took it back to David. Now David didn't request it. They just did it. And by the way, I thought that was one of the forceful pieces of Dan's lesson last week on Joshua, speaking about you, the people of Believer's Chapel. His application. We have needs here. All ministries do. There are needs in abundance. But you, you, the believer priest, you don't run around and organize a committee, write a letter. You see a need, you just go do it. Without direction, like the ant in Proverbs 6, without guidance, Overview, he just works. He just does. And so, these men, just like you, they just did it. They bagged up water. They took it to David. And then, I want you to notice your text. Suddenly, the pace of everything slows down here. We've been going through a litany of names. Name after name after name. But now, suddenly, the pace of the text slows for effect. Because the enormity of what these men did struck him. Struck David. And David does something here that completely surprises us. Rather than drink it as a king would and toast his loyal companions that brought it to him, he rather takes that bag of water and he lifts it up and he pours it out as a drink offering. In a hot and thirsty land where the sand quickly absorbed the contents to the point 
that there would be no trace of that water whatsoever in a matter of minutes. But from that event, we learn something stellar about David. We learn something about ourselves. What we are. What we're about. And we learn about our proverb as well. I've studied this passage a number of times over the years and I've actually changed my view of it. I see four particular points I want to highlight from this event. David poured it out as a drink offering to the Lord. First, as an act of spontaneous worship. Spontaneous worship. You see, that should be our day. Our day to day. It's the consciousness of all of our life being ordained by God that we would say, praise God. Praise God for this. Thank God for that. The memory of a friend, a companion, comes to your mind. Praise God. Praise God for that truth. Spontaneous worship. Second, by David pouring it out, he was displaying that he was unworthy of that water as much as he was unworthy of those men that brought it to him. I spent an hour or so with a, a man that has forgotten more Hebrew than I would ever learn in a lifetime. And we were talking about the fine points of some text, and suddenly he said something that jarred me because I'd never thought about it before. He said, isn't it interesting that there is no simple definition to the word hesed? Covenant faithfulness, covenant loyalty, loving kindness. So many different ways to translate that word. Why is that? He said. I've never thought about it. He said, because there's no word like it in all the world. That's why. You can't wrap your brain around it in any language of the world. It is directly from heaven about God's relationship to you and me what we know only as He sends us off in the Great Commission. I am with you always. And I love you. We scratch our heads trying to define that love. It is supernatural. David poured that water out because he was not worthy of these men that brought it to him. Here's the third. He poured it out only because it was the right thing to do. You see, in a matter of minutes, those contents, they're gone. There's no trace of them. And the effort and the energy and the planning and the skill to stealthily get into Bethlehem, get that water, and if necessary, fight all the way to get it back out of that place. And you see, that's the definition of real true worship. We don't, we don't keep score. We don't keep records. We're not uh, working to have 
a name or a reputation. Uh, Mr. Spurgeon said, I don't want my name uh, carved upon any piece of granite. Only the Word of God carved upon the hearts of people. You see, that's the real life of skill. We're constantly working and serving one another. Focusing on others better than ourselves. And then we forget about it. And we go on to the next thing. We're priests who are in constant service to one another. And this act, this act, that's the only right thing to do. We are not people that say, for all that I have done for you, or for all that I have done for this or that. No, we are constantly serving knowing that our labor is never in vain. Here's the fourth and final thing that I observe from this. And this is quite new for me. Well, finally, what they did, they did for a great king. You see, I think these men got it. Who were these men? Well, they were the gifted. They were the gold coats, right. And they were a subset of a larger group. And what was that larger group? Well, they were the outcasts. People in debt, broken, hard timers. You know who they are? They're you and me. Outcasts of the world. But they found something in David that was attractive. Just like we, attractive to the Lord, and we gather about Him. And now we are in allegiance to Him. You see, what they did, they did for a great king. A king, by the way, that had no kingdom. You see, the flags didn't run in front of David. No horn was blown when he entered a town or a place. He was an outlaw. And these people found him worthy. Now, you come here to Believer's Chapel, there's no throne here. This is not a high cathedral, a place for a king. No, this is a simple place to hear the Word of God and to practice the ordinances of the church in remembrance of Him, in faithfulness to Him. And that's what we do. And we wait for Him. Our King has no kingdom today. It's not here. It's only in our hearts. And so that's what we do. And we do it all for Him. Now here's the application to our proverb. I want you to look at the last line here. A friend who has such a heart of Hesed, loving kindness, loyalty, loyal love. A friend who is closer than a member of your own family. A brother. Trust me, the world doesn't produce such people. They only come from God. And God inserts them into your life. They come to you. Just like these men came to David. 
How did they come? We don't know. How did you come? Everybody's story is different. But they came to the king. Just like you and I came to the king. David, in that moment, he recognized something very supernatural about these people. And that's why he poured that water out to the Lord. Because God only brings people like that into your life. Closer than a brother. A friend for all seasons. A friend who is supernatural. Now, here we are in 19. Look at us. We're running through the pages of Proverbs together. A better than proverb that asserts that a poor person's daily walk with, in righteousness is in a better situation than a liar. He is better than because God's going to punish the liar. So the contrast is the integrity of a poor person versus a fool. The poor person is wise. The fool most likely is successful. Lying lips, let's remember, lying lips are for the moment. That's Proverbs. For the moment. You see, it's the adulterous waters that are sweet in the Proverbs. For the moment. But wisdom, the skill for living, that's what endures. That's what lasts. What is the book of Proverbs? It's a book of child training. Child training in the home. And that child training goes from generation to generation to generation. Because you see, wisdom is linear. It goes on and on and on and on. Luther taught us to sing, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. Because the skill for living is the same in the day that this was written as it is today. It's all the truth. And at last, for generation to generation. That's what we have here. Observe this top line. The poor person walks. The word that implies daily fellowship. He walks in his, look, integrity. That's blamelessness. Used by God of Job, chapter 1, verse 8, describing Job as the man in the Old Testament who is the gold standard for righteousness. If you doubt that, just read his testimony. Job chapter 31. Put your running shoes on and jog with Job. You won't last very long. So is this man's righteousness. So the poor man is in his blamelessness. He is, in fact, the secure man. The world wants security. Here is the poor man secure. Psalm 91, he rests daily under the shadow of the Almighty. So he's secure. None of us want COVID-19. We put masks on, we wash our hands constantly. We're putting on that disinfectant some way or another. But we all know that we abide under the providence of God every day. And what I've tried to remind myself of during this period of time is Acts 28.3. That's where Paul was washed ashore at Malta. 
That viper fastened himself to Paul's hand, and what did he do? He just shook it off in the fire. Now the natives, they all focused on the viper. What it could possibly mean. But the apostle never gave it a second thought. You see, moment by moment, we are under His watch care in full confidence that He will never take His eye off of us, nor will we lose our relationship with Him. By contrast, line two, look, we are dealing with the man with the twisted lips. That word twisted we saw for the first time in Proverbs 2.15, translated crooked, used by David, Psalm 18, verse 26, to the pure you show yourself pure, but to the crooked, there's our word, twisted. David says to the Lord, you show yourself shrewd. David says, The wicked man thinks that he has all the right cards to win the game of life, only to find that the Lord God has all the aces. That's the word shrewd. That's my translation. Look, the Hebrew lexicon translates whose ways are twisted. The twisted, crooked lip will not find any good and will be headed for calamity. A proverb that we've already covered, 1720, one whose heart is corrupt does not prosper. One whose tongue is perverse falls into trouble. Now the poor in this life, they may have lots of trouble, but they overcome the struggle because that's who we are by nature. We are overcomers. One of my favorite Spurgeon quotes, the one that inspires me, I guess, the most, comes from his sermon, Esther's Exaltation, or, comma, Who Knoweth? Here's what Spurgeon says. If God has a purpose to serve by a man, that man will live out his days and accomplish the divine design. The more resistance he experiences, the more surely will his life work be accomplished. The more resistance he experiences, the more surely will his life work be accomplished, be achieved. That's the power of God. One more. Verse 2, if even desire... Now, if you have the translation there, the word zeal, there's no support for that. So it's uh, desire without knowledge. It's not good. How much more? So we have another how much more proverb. Will the one who hastens with his feet miss the way? We have heard the English saying, haste makes waste. There is uh, a proverb here that's for an impulsive person like myself. That's me. This opening of the top line, if even. We've seen this opening before. 1728, if even a fool keeps silent, he is considered wise. Now the word desire refers to the appetite. Literally, the soul's desire. Here's your illustration of the word. Judges 14.1 Samson went down to Timnah. He saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. So he returned and told his father and mother, I've seen a daughter of the Philistines in Timnah. Now get her for me as a wife. Human desire without knowledge. Proverbs says it's not good. Advice, counsel, 
from the book of Consequences. Proverbs 13, 15. Good understanding wins favor, but the way of the transgressor is hard. So here's the question that we have to ask ourselves. Do the promises of God run fast enough for us that we're willing to wait for them? Or must we hasten on our own? Look, will the one who hastens... You know where that phrase is used in the Old Testament? It's, Acts, it's Exodus chapter 5, verse 13. It's used of the, of the Egyptian slave masters telling the people to hasten on in your work. What is that? That's brick without straws. That's who the slave masters were. And they're burning in hell this moment for those orders because they never spent any time to think about what they were doing. Oppressing these people. No one ever asked, wait a minute, aren't these the relatives of Joseph? Didn't Joseph do a, a great deal for us down in the land of Goshen? No, no one spent time Asking that question. The hastening here in line two. Notice it's with the feet. The fool is the real go-getter. Laboring. Mark it well, the enemy of your soul. He wants to keep you busy. Tied up. Full schedule as much as possible. That cuts down on your time to think and reflect. Time to process. Those important questions like, what would God have me to do about this or that? Or how about, in light of what I've learned from His Word, how should I then live the rest of my days? But see, the fool, look, he misses the way. A life, a plan from God. See, the rich fool of Luke chapter 12, he hastened his way. Already rich, says our Lord, but too busy to think, to consider. Oh, he was busy tearing down his barns, building bigger ones, and in the midst of his doing, he dies. God counted him out. Give yourself some thinking time. Stay in the Word. Stay in prayer. Each day with the Lord, lay your day before Him, and He will put your day together. He'll do it. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. And He'll get it accomplished. That's what we believe. That's the skill for living. Let's close in prayer. Thank You, Father, for this time in the Word, to study Your Word, Thank You for these people, these believer priests. Thank You for their efforts. Thank You for the Radford family and for their great testimony throughout the decades right here at this place. Bless us, Lord, and teach us the importance of living a life of skill, of wisdom to serve and honor You, our only wise God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.